everybody. Welcome to A Good Place, where truth and integrity meet. Every week, of course, I introduce you to thought-provoking and compelling premier educators, whistleblowers, best-selling authors, journalists, activists, and celebrities. They all have one thing in common, though. They are people of truth and integrity, and many are considered modern-day heroes. Today, I have a guest like that with me. A decade ago, my guest, Terry Giles, served as the lead trial lawyer in one of the major sex abuse actions against the Catholic Church. Lawyer-turned-entrepreneur will explain what sets high achievers, the 15%, apart from those who don't quite make it. This is a riveting story of what it takes to win and keep winning in business and in life from one of America's most successful entrepreneurs with a forward by Secretary of Housing and Urban Development, Dr. Ben Carson. And that is his book. It's called The 15%. On the service, Terry has a class American success story. By 30, he built one of the largest criminal defense firms and generated tens of millions in revenue working with high-profile clients. By 34, he left the legal profession and achieved even greater success as an entrepreneur, seemingly overnight. But as Giles observes in the 15%, no one goes through life without facing serious obstacles. Speaking from his own hard-won experience from a difficult upbringing to America's loftiest boardrooms, Giles answers the question what took him years to answer. Why do some people overcome hardships while others do not? Citing research that 15% of those individuals who face adversity and hardships were able to rise above the despair and succeed above all odds, Giles uses examples from his career and life to illustrate why and how this phenomenon occurs. From his, ha- from his childhood in the Missouri Ozarks to defending the victims of child sex abuse to creating a plethora of business enterprises and even organizing a presidential campaign, he learns from his experience and traits that define the 15%. His own personal story, along with this, his astounding life and work accomplishments, will make for one of my most fascinating interviews to date. So thank you, Terry, for being here and joining me today. It's great to be with you. Thank you for having me. I'm looking forward to this. So let's jump in because we have an hour here and that's it. And, uh, you know, I spent a lot of time researching you and I even have someone assisting me with this. And my goodness, you've accomplished so much. So I would like to talk about you first before we get into your book. And you, I guess let's talk about what are you most proud of as far as achievements and accomplishments go? Um, what proved to be what? Yeah. What are you most proud of? You know, probably uh, the thing that I think of when you say that is something that was also the hardest thing that I had to do, and and that was um, my criminal defense uh, practice of law. Uh, I built the practice over eight and a half years, and we had been highly successful. We were making over 600 court appearances a month. Uh, in six and a half years, I tried 90 criminal cases to verdict, including 13 murders and three death penalty cases. Uh, you know, it was lucrative. It was, you know, your name's in the paper every day. And it was a very heady time for me. And um, I had wanted to be a trial lawyer from the time I was probably in fifth grade. So I was on top of the world, um, experiencing exactly what I had hoped I would be experiencing at that point in my life. And then um, something happened. I had a client by the name of Fred Douglas, and Fred was accused of killing nine women. And um, the police made some mistakes. We got some evidence suppressed. A couple of things really went my way in the trial, and I ended up getting Fred off. And then six months later, he killed two more girls. And I was confronted with the fact that, and I I guess I was confronted with a question that I didn't have an answer for, and that is, why is the world a better place? Because I do what I do for a living. And so it had been my goal. It had been my dream. I was living my dream, but I realized I was going to have to walk away from the practice, which is what I did. And uh, it was the hardest thing I've ever done. But it's probably the thing I'm most proud of, um, that I, I, I knew it wasn't right anymore. I knew I had to make the change. And then it was uh, the, the fact that I had developed the practice of law. It was a business, basically. You know, we had 35 lawyers, over 100 employees. 
and I had successfully created a business from scratch. So why couldn't I do that again, only in some other field? And that's really what began my business career. And I've been lucky enough to have car dealerships and banks and manufacturing companies produce the play on Broadway. Uh, currently, uh, I own two uh, five-star hotels in Europe, and I'm chairman of a company in uh, headquartered in San Francisco. We're a business consulting firm. We have 41 offices in 21 countries. And uh, I never would have experienced any of that if I if I didn't have uh, whatever it was that that allowed me to walk away uh, from my career uh, many years ago. Mm-hmm. So that's the thing I'm most proud of. And it was also the hardest thing I probably have done in my lifetime. So you were disillusioned. Yeah, completely. Uh, you know, I grew up on uh, Perry Mason and Owen Marshall and, you know, the uh, lawyers on TV always represent innocent clients, <laughs> but in real life, it doesn't work that way. Right. And I know you represented uh, some notorious celebrities and, and also just celebrities in general. Would you care to share a few of those people? Uh, you know, one of the, one of the folks I represented that, that, uh, I mean, he, he's one of uh, several geniuses that I've had the chance to, um, to know and, and to represent. And that was Richard Pryor. And uh, after Richard had set himself on fire in the famous uh, uh, freebasing incident, uh, I was involved in in representing Richard on a number of things. And uh, during that period of time, um, we were looking to get as much good publicity for Richard as we could because his his agent, great agent in Hollywood by the name of Skip Brittenham, was negotiating for Richard at the time, the largest uh, movie contract in history at that moment. And um, I got a call from the White House and Ronald Reagan was president at that time. And Reagan was under some pressure as not doing enough for black causes. And he had decided to take on uh, making Martin Luther King's birthday a national holiday. And so the White House contacted me and asked if I could get Richard Pryor to come back to D.C. and give a speech uh, that would sort of uh, headline what the Reagan administration was trying to do. And, of course, Richard, despite the freebasing incident, was certainly one of the most um, famous and well-liked African-Americans in the country at the time, if not the most liked and respected. And so as a result, uh, we did. He and I went back to Washington, D.C. He gave an unbelievable speech. I remember he broke down crying three times in the speech. And the Washington Post, the next morning, the headline was, The Gesture Weeps. And uh, I honestly believe that what Richard there went a long way in, uh, in helping to solidify uh, the political support for making Martin Luther King's birthday a national holiday. And I always thought Richard didn't get enough credit for that either. He was, uh, Richard was quite a guy, really, really uh, quite a man. Yeah, people really respected him. And I know he struggled, he had inner demons. But despite all of that, uh, he he was well regarded. And I know that people in Hollywood looked up to him and just really, really felt for him and was hoping that he'd be able to overcome his addictions, which he did not. Yeah, you know, it it was interesting when when Richard, every time I was dealing with Richard, he was completely sober. And uh, he was almost uh, painfully shy uh, if he wasn't drinking or obviously using drugs. I think think how that happened is uh, it was that's when he would do that, then he would get on stage and he was a completely different personality. And, uh, but boy, when he was sober and at home, he was, he was just a delight to deal with. 
I'd imagine so. Well, I'd like to fast forward a little bit to some of the cases that you took on pertaining to the Catholic Church uh, sex abuse cases in the United States, because yep. that was a pivotal accomplishment. And this is kind of before most of the public was aware of this or had a hard time believing that this could occur. And uh, would you like to jump into that? Because that's something that yeah. most of us are finally aware of this. And I can't believe, because I did some research on this, I can't believe that there were cases reported since the 50s and nothing was ever done about it. And we can get into the details of why that occurred and why it was so difficult to prosecute these people in the church. So go ahead. How did you become involved in a case like this? Well, what happened was um, uh, a, a very close associate of mine, actually a, a lady lawyer who had um, worked for me and uh, now had gone out on her own, uh, got a case. And this was in the, I want to say the mid-1990s. Uh, a young man who uh, had just come out of high school in Orange County, uh, an all all boys Catholic high school, uh, went to her and said he had been molested uh, by the principal of the school who was a priest. And uh, Kathy contacted me. Kathy Freeberg was the lady lawyer, and she contacted me because one of the also one of the people who I had worked with earlier in my career was now the lawyer representing the Catholic Church in Orange County. Uh, a terrific lawyer by the name of Pete Callahan. And so she asked me if I would talk to Pete to see if we could settle the case. Uh, but in those days, the church was denying everything and they weren't settling anything. And although I went and talked to Pete, uh, was not surprised when he said, look, Terry, we're not going to, you know, we don't think this happened and we're not going to settle the case. And then uh, Kathy did an extraordinary thing, and that is uh, she, we knew that this priest had visited a hospital in New Mexico. And we weren't sure, it was a Catholic hospital, but we weren't sure what was behind it. And so we wanted to get the medical records. And at that point, no court in the country had ever ordered the church to turn over hospital records for the priests because of the confidentiality. But uh, a judge in Orange County was convinced that he should, in fact, order the release of this report. Well, it turns out that that was the hospital where the Catholic Church sent all of their, of their uh, 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 pedophile priests. And in fact, when we got this priest's report back, uh, it, they had identified him as a pedophile and they had advised uh, the church in Orange County to make sure never to allow him to be around kids. And so he got released from the hospital, he came back and they assigned him to be principal of a boys high school, which, you know, is, is just crazy. Absolutely. And uh, yes. and then that I think that still is the largest settlement uh, that the church paid on any case. But after that, the legislature in California decided to pass a law. Everybody is so shocked. They decided to pass a law that would suspend the statute of limitations. So for one year, anybody who had ever been molested by a priest in California could file a lawsuit. And now it became much easier because all we had to do was look at the priest records. And if they ever visited that hospital, then we knew that they, in fact, were a pedophile. And uh, 800 cases got filed in California, and we represented 150 of the 800. And we had to do a psych workup on each of the clients. And that's when I was shocked to find out that within psychiatric science, if you have a serious hardship occur to you, there's 85% of the time it will hurt your life, sometimes destroy your life. But for some reason, in 15% of the cases, the person comes out of the other side stronger and better than they would have been had they not gone through the hardship at all. 
Mm-hmm. And that was stunning to me. And then when we began to examine our clients, we had 20 that fell within the 15%, which was almost exactly 15% of our 150 clients. And so that really got me thinking about this. And then I've been involved in uh, the scholarship committee for Horatio Alger for 26 years. And we're now the largest deed-based scholarship program in the country, the Horatio Alger Association is. And now we have 40,000 applicants for 2,500 scholarships. So we brought in a bunch of psychiatrists to help us to pick out, you know, who are we looking for? Because we want kids that are going to be able to complete college and, you know, go on and do great things in life. And it, it, you know, again, it kind of stunned me because they said, oh, that's easy. You're looking for the 15%. And so that really got me. Uh, thinking about it. And my earlier life, I had faced a lot of things that that psychologists and psychiatrists would tell you is major hardship. My mom had me when she was 18. Uh, we were very, very poor. Uh, my dad had gone through World War II, but unfortunately became an alcoholic. And so he disappeared for months at a time, eventually ended up in jail in Arizona. Um, my mom, we were living in the foot of the Ozark Mountains on the Missouri side. My mom was um, not really educated further than high school, so she did her best uh, to care for my sister and I, but we ended up moving a lot. I went to, I uh, changed schools 21 times in my first 10 years in school. So I'd gone through a number of things that people would say, okay, those are those qualify as hardship, and yet my life and my sister's life both turned out to be very, very successful. So I began to look at that and then doing some further research to see if we couldn't figure out what are the elements, what are the characteristics that allow the 15% to work their way through hardships. And then are these things something that's built into the DNA? Is it just luck? Or are they skills that can be learned? Because if they're skills that can be taught and learned, well, then we're not limited to the 15%. It could be the 25% or the 50%, the 75%. And wouldn't the world be a better place if, if more people could work their way through hardship? So that was really, that's why the name of the book is The 15%. And, and that was really the question I was attempting to answer uh, in the book. Will you share with everyone, I was reading the foreword of your book, and there was one particular gentleman you interviewed, and you could not believe how, he, how successful he'd become despite his abuses. Can you go into detail about that, and can you share some of the abuses, the details of abuses that people had experienced that you were interviewing during that time? Well, first of all, the abuse was, uh, in in a lot of the cases, was horrific. Uh, I mean, I, I remember this particular client, the abuse that he suffered, which, by the way, we probably had five or six clients that suffered the same kind of abuse. Uh, their father had died, and their mom was left raising the kids alone, and she was a good Catholic, and she would invite the priest over to have dinner with her and her family because she thought it'd be good for the boys. And the priest would come over to their house, and then while she's making dinner, he would go upstairs. She thought he was going upstairs to, you know, to be with the boys and work with them. Actually, he was molesting the boys upstairs while she's making dinner. To and then they extent? would come down and all have dinner together. I mean, it's just, I mean, it's just horrific stuff. When and you say molest, young boys were, yeah. sorry to interrupt. Are, so I just wanted to get some details. When you say molest, what do you mean? Sodomy? Do you mean um, fellatio? I'm just curious. Um, yeah, it's pretty much that, all of the above. It was um, obviously oral sex was a big part of it. And, uh, and it was, uh, you know, it's kind of interesting. Uh, some of the priests, it wasn't so much self-gratification for them. I mean, there was self-gratification, get me wrong, 
but they weren't they they just really wanted to fondle the kids uh that is what got them off uh other cases uh obviously they wanted the kids to do more uh to them but it was some pretty pretty tough stuff and uh the priest I especially uh disliked I guess would be the right term were the ones who would then mix in uh, religious, uh, almost cult-like religiousness into the experience for the children. And, and that was especially horrible. Uh-huh. But, but this one particular client that you mentioned, because almost all of our clients, um, because they had been molested by an authority figure, they turned their back on authority figures. So they started doing bad in school. They can't hold a job. They get trouble with the law. Uh, you know, they, they never get along with their bosses. They really rebel against authority their whole life. Mm-hmm. And as a result, their life's pretty ruined for the most part. But like I said, there was this 15% in this one particular client, the first, first one of our clients that were part of the 15% that I met, he had undergone a molestation very similar to what I described, um, you know, upstairs while mom's making dinner. But when he showed up for the deposition, I met him at the deposition. I was meeting him for the first time. And, uh, you know, he was wearing a beautiful suit. He was a very successful uh, businessman. He was making, uh, I think, something close to $300,000 a year. Uh, it, it, he was very successful. He uh, had a wonderful marriage. He had two great kids, and, and he was just as well balanced as as you could imagine uh, from a from a psychiatric standpoint. And I was somewhat amazed because I'd been dealing with clients whose lives had really been destroyed. And so I started talking to him about it, and he said, "Look, uh, you know what happened was terrible." I didn't like it. Obviously, I didn't like it. I hated it. But I didn't get stuck there. I've moved through it. He says, I know so many people now that have this has happened to them, and they've gotten stuck being victims, and it's, and it's ruined their lives. He said, I moved through it. And I, I asked him, you know, because his wife goes to church with the kids, and I said, do you go to church? And he said, no, I don't. He says, I, I'm still spiritual, but this kind of beat the religion out of me. He says, well, that's okay for my family to go. I don't think they're under any, any threat and any danger, and we know what to look out for now. But he was so um, appropriate about everything. He was so well-balanced uh, mentally, and it, it amazed me. And that was the first one I met since then. Of course, I met several others, but it really impacted me. Uh, watching, knowing what this this man went through, and then looking at what he had done with his life, I mean, it truly was remarkable. Mm-hmm. Why do you think that children weren't coming forward? How did the priests have so much control over a child uh, from talking about such horrific experiences? Well, you know, they just scared them. Uh, you know, basically, uh, they told them that if they went, if they came forward, some would, would tell the kid that, that uh, nobody will believe them. You know, they'd just be seen as a liar. Uh, sometimes they, they threatened them uh, with, uh, you know, religious uh, taunts, you know, you'll go to hell, you know, that kind of thing. Mm-hmm. Uh, sometimes the threats were, were more basic, you know, uh, but it was amazing how many of these kids they knew that they were doing something wrong and that embarrassed them. And it's amazing how many, when they were kids, thought somehow it was their fault. Therefore, they did, truly didn't want to get in, in, in trouble with their parents, et cetera. Yeah, that's very and common of course, with children who are abused. That's, that's highly yeah. common. And, you know, the the church was denying everything. So, uh, and they did that for years and years. And uh, finally things have broken open. And, you know, I think, I think, uh, I think this 
the new pope, I say the new pope, he's been there now for a couple of years. He, I think he's the real thing. I really think he wants to clean it up and, uh, and, and make a difference. So I'm, I'm hopeful that's true. You know, I, I should also say too, I had the unique uh, opportunity to travel around the country and actually to other areas of the world to take depositions and put priests and bishops and some cardinals under oath in depositions, which is a pretty unique uh, opportunity. And while there were some real bad folks out there, along the way, I also met some really, obviously they weren't the perpetrators, but I, I met and, and, and got to know some really great folks in the Catholic Church. I mean, there were there were there were priests and whatnot. Who Here, hold your thought. We'll be going on. Sorry about that. We have a commercial break right now, so hold on. Hold on. Hold on. Hold on. Hold on. Everybody. Well, welcome back, and I'm here with Terry Giles. So, Terry, let's pick up where we left off over the commercial break. How come it took so long for these types of cases to stick? And I know, you know, I know a bit about the topic, and I'm just curious why it took so long. I mean, I know some of the obvious reasons, including myself. The first time I heard that this was occurring in the United States, I thought that's just not true. That that it can't be true because you know we put these priests on a pedestal, and I just had such a hard time understanding and fathoming that somebody could do such a thing to a child, much less a priest. Yeah, well, I think that was a, a big part of it. Was it seemed unbelievable uh, to most people, and then the church was denying everything, and that that it didn't seem like it was a. Uh, uh, it seemed like it was a denial that was was in fact you know accurate and and why would the i mean even worse i mean could the church really be doing all this and then lying about it that really seemed impossible to believe and then the courts basically uh without knowing it was protecting them because judges didn't believe it either so you know lawyers were asking for these medical reports and other things but the courts just weren't weren't releasing it because everybody thought that those claims were silly and there was no way that, that it was true. Mm. So as a result, um, you know, they got away with it for a very, very long time. I actually didn't even understand the 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 how how prevalent this was until the Boston Globe article that came out in like 2002, which of course went on the, the story behind it all came, uh, ended up being a movie uh, spotlight, which actually was nominated for an Oscar. So that's, that was the first time I really heard that. And even then in 2002, when I started to understand the vast amount of people that were uh, complaining of this, um, it, it's just, it was just a difficult thing. And um but now people know, and it's still like I think most people who are aware of these crimes, it, it it just leaves such a sadness, like a permanent sadness in your psyche to know that this has happened and that it's gone on for so long. Well, there's no question; they ruined so many people's lives. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Anyway, so let's talk about the people, including the man. I know we discussed briefly about the man who was able to turn his life around and um, become well-adjusted, become a very successful member of society. So what are these traits and how can people, because most people have experienced uh, some kind of trauma in their life and, and have had so many struggles. I mean, even like wealthy people, people born into wealthy families, they struggle as well. They've had their own form of abuse. They've had, you know, they struggle with alcoholism and addiction and gambling and things like that. So we all know that it doesn't matter what your background is, that trauma and hardships and difficulties in life are just part of life. That is life. Yeah. You know, let me, let me go to the bottom line and then we'll work our way backwards is probably the best way to do this. 
what happens when somebody goes through hardship, and I mean everybody, I'm not distinguishing now between the 85% and the 15%. Everybody has a tendency to say, why me? That's just a human reaction. But what happens with the 85% is they get stuck there. They see themselves as a victim. Then they begin to speak as if they're a victim. They conduct themselves as if they're a victim. And pretty soon they get they get stuck in victimhood, what I would refer to as victimhood. And the next thing that can happen that's a real negative is they start to feel sorry for themselves. And the worst thing that, thing that can happen is they then kind of get off on other people feeling sorry for them. Now they are really stuck. And I don't know if there is a way out if you get that deep into victimhood. What happens with the 15% is they go, why me? And they feel the pain, but they, but, but they don't get stuck there. Basically, they say, look, I really did not like this. And that, you know, the pain is very real. And I don't want to have to, I don't, not everyone have to go through this again in my life. And so I'm going to figure out what happened here. So they don't let, yeah, they this. don't let their experience, sorry to interject, I just wanted to, to share this. So they don't let their experience define who they are. It was the experience. It's not them. I think that was something that just popped in my head. That, no, that's, that is exactly right. And so as they move through it to the other side, they realize that there's a wonderful, wonderful life out there. And they begin to realize that they are more in control of their life than they might have thought that they were. And and that's the truth. They are in control of their life. They're not at the effect of life. It's life is not something that's just happening to them. They have some control over it and they're driving it. Now, once you're able to go through and you break through, you can imagine what a, what a positive feeling that is for someone. And now they begin to become more and more positive in their life as they see basically them creating, uh, you know, miracles in their life. And, and it, and it, it, it really takes hold. Now there's all sorts of now moving back to the individual characteristics one of the most important things is understanding the power of words. Words are amazing. You know, words make us laugh. Words make us cry. Words are so important to us. We live in a world where, you know, unfortunately people hear no a lot more than they hear yes. People are told they can't do this or can't do that more than they're told, hey, you can, you can make it. You can do it. And as a result, it's easy for people to take on negative attitudes. And then if they go through a serious hardship, it's really easy to get stuck. Now, when I say the power of words, too, I'm talking about the use of words in your own head. You know how we walk around and we think to ourselves? The words we use inside our own head is important because we start to believe those words. And so uh, that, that's a, that is such an important f- factor. The other is developing or trying to develop a low fear factor. And the best thing I can say there is real life begins on the other side of your comfort zone. So being able to move to an area where you're not comfortable in life, being able to, to, to expand um, your, your world out to an area which isn't comfortable at first. It'll become comfortable later, but isn't comfortable at first. That allows you to to see new things, to have new ideas, to see the world as in a different light. Um, the one of the 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 benefits of all of the different kinds of businesses I've been in is it's it's been remarkable from the standpoint of the things I've learned. But if I wasn't willing to go out there and try new things, that would never have happened to me. So developing a low fear factor, moving outside your comfort zone, understanding the power of words, these are all traits that, that, that if you can develop that trait or characteristic, 
it's it you're you're going to be much more successful in life and you're going to move through whatever hardships you may face now it is true that in some cases it's built into somebody's dna they're just like that i mean you know we have two kids we've raised and you know they have completely different personalities they've been raised in the same household with the same mom and dad and they have two completely different personalities so we know we come imprinted in life with different kinds of personalities it's different kind of character traits so for some it's built in for some like me it was lucky there were some things that happened early on in my life that were just lucky i mentioned those in the book but there are also things that that could and, and by the way all these things can still be learned some of them, I learned it because I had somebody who took the time to mentor me, uh, took the time to explain things to me, took the time uh, to tell me some of the things I'm trying to tell others in the book, bottom line. Mm -hmm. And then what can people do? Because some people will hear this and they may not actually be able to understand or implement it. And I, I'm I guess what I'm trying to say from my own experience and me working in uh, fields where I was trying to assist people that were that were also abused and suffered um, from addiction and various things, including trauma, um, it's just being able to get to, even though it feels like unnatural at first to think differently, just fake it till you make it. That's one of the things I always told people, my clients, I said, you just have to fake it till you make it. You have to just speak differently to yourself, like scratch the record in your head. So your your the record in your head is like maybe saying, um, "What's the use? I never do well anymore. I just I don't have the I don't have the tools or what you know just that depressive type of thinking. You just have to All those you know words yeah. You have to rephrase it, even if you have to write it down. With my kids, uh, I don't know if you know, you don't know this. Um, I foster kids and I've adopted foster kids. And they came very damaged, highly damaged, little innocent creatures, just so damaged. And the way they talked to themselves and the things that were, when they were verbally abused, they own that. They own what was said. They believed the lie that was told to them. And I'd always say, okay, you're saying this about yourself. Where did you hear that? My mom said it, and I know she's right, and blah, 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 blah. I'll go, okay, we're going to write down the opposite about you. I want you to say, I am, and then, like, we'd write down the opposite of what their belief system was telling them. It really is work and effort, but it does become natural down the road. And for me, uh, I'm only sharing this not to talk about me, but because this worked for me. When I was going through things, I would think to myself, gosh, I mean, really, what? For me, it was I'd look around the world and it was so beautiful and there was just wonderful people. And I said, I'm going to focus on that. That's what I'm going to focus on, the beauty of the world and books and literature and uh, film and just in these wonderful people that do exist. Because, you know, everyone's aware there are very horrible people and very damaged people and damaged people sometimes become the perpetrators in life. And that's one of the worst things is to see this cycle repeated over and over. So you really do have the power. I don't think people understand that they have the power within themselves to change, uh, to change how they treat themselves, to change how they treat others, and not to feel guilt. Because as we talked about earlier, we touched upon it, is that people tend to feel like it was their fault. So common with people. They carry guilt. They shouldn't be carrying guilt for their experiences. And so you have to forgive yourself, even though there's no reason for you to, to carry this guilt. You have to disown that. You are not guilty because you were victimized as a child or even as an adult. And that's something that was very powerful to me and something I wanted to share, which kind of aligns with your, with what you discuss in your book. Yeah, absolutely. You know, um, athletes talk all the time, really great athletes talk all the time about visualization and that they actually can see uh, something happen before it's occurred. Uh, golfers, uh, before they hit a shot, professional golfers watch them. They'll always stand behind their ball and they'll stare out. And what they're actually doing is visualizing themselves hitting the perfect shot before they stand up to the ball. Larry Bird talked about visualization, uh, Wayne Gretzky, uh, Joe Montana, Joe, 
as far back as Joe DiMaggio in baseball. So there, there have been uh, visualization is something well known in sports, but I contend that visualization can also work in our daily lives. You can visualize yourself as a better husband or a better father or a better sibling or a better employer, or a better employee. You do you it can in detail. Visualize yourself as 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 something better than you are, and then if you can align your conversation, your words, and your conduct, the things you do, with that visualization, that is what will happen in your life. In other words, if you can visualize a better version of you, and then you back it up with everything you say and do, I'm telling you, the universe will not deny you. Now you just got to be careful what you ask for, because you're probably going to get it. <laughs> exactly. And that's a very hard thing for people to believe, especially people who've been through so much. Well, how can there be any, of course, the question is, how can there be a God when this is allowed? If I would have yeah. never created this for myself, or people say, oh, well, you know, some people who talk about visualization, everything that you have had experience in your life is because you thought about it because you created it and that doesn't really work for people who are children that were abused or trafficked or um, molested um, which is a form of abuse and that is just something that um, yeah, that's something that's really difficult for many people well you know when you look around if you look around your your home or your office or wherever you are Everything you see, uh, somebody made. And in order to make that, they had to think it up. I mean, we're pretty used to, for instance, chairs, but somebody had to invent the first chair. And, and I like that. In fact, I use it in the, in the book that I think the first building block for anything in our physical university, our universe is, a, is what I call Thoughtron. In other words, before you align the protons and neutrons and atoms and everything that make up the physical item, somebody has thought about that. Somebody has, it, it, it has been imagined by somebody. Mm -hmm. They've thought about it first. And so why can't you continue to, it's everything we look at, somebody did that. So why mm -hmm. can't we do that in our own lives? Of course we can, we're capable of doing that. Just have to believe in yourself. Yeah, and also not just believing. Uh, another key to that is people ruminate. They just think about the past too much. And one of the most powerful things I ever heard, and I can't remember who the author was, he talked about the past is an illusion. I think uh, Eckhart Tolle also said this too. Um, he it was called. He wrote a book called The Power of Now. He said that's an illusion. Don't even focus on it. You need to be right here, right now. Where are you? Where Where are your feet? You're right here and right now. And so the past is just a lie. A lie is an illusion. It's the past. And so at this point on, you can choose to focus on what you would like to focus on. And there's people I speak to every day that have ongoing trauma. They're still in abusive relationships. They're still being tortured. They're still horrible things. And they're in that. There's they can't get out of it yet, but they're still able to to adapt like there's a book uh also that i brew i didn't get to read the whole thing it was about a concentration uh, camp survivor and he wrote about how they still found joy in a concentration camp and i always thought to myself well if they can do it anybody can do it i can do it it the possibility is there if you choose to do so and also, the other thing you can do is you can advocate. You, you can become an advocate for whatever it is that you experienced, whether it was abuse, addiction. Just That's where I find empowered people. They are advocating for crimes that are perpetrated against them. They advocate for other victims. They advocate for bringing attention and public awareness. And that's where I find the most inspired people and the people that are able to overcome challenges. Well, you know, once they decide to, uh, you're exactly right. And once they decide to advocate for others, they have now moved out of, of seeing themselves as only a victim. Mm -hmm. and they begin to move through it. They move to the other side. You know, the worst thing that can happen to a community, a, a nation, anything, 
is to have leadership teaching victimhood. Uh, it it is just so destructive. It is so destructive. Um, and it, uh, just the one thing that really drives me crazy is is when we have politicians that will teach victimhood. You know, and and that just boy, they're they're hurting so many people. I'm not even sure they they're fully aware of how damaging. Uh, they Can are. you give me an example of uh, that? Well, uh, yeah, I, I, I mean, I, I, I also should, I can say some positive things about, for instance, Senator Sanders. Uh, for instance, he is very passionate. He, he, he tells the truth. I mean, he's felt the way he feels all the way through. So he's, he's not changing his view because of of uh, you know the latest polling or anything like that, he has stuck with his views. I, I respect that. Uh, I may not agree with him, but I respect it completely. He has passionate followers, and you know that's that's a positive. But socialism, socialism, what's baked into socialism is victimhood. It just is. It's telling people that you are a victim. You have been victimized, and the only thing that's going to that's going to help you is the government's going to come in and take care of things for you, and that really can cause it can, it can cause people to get stuck in that victimhood. In in my opinion, if you look at if you look at the history of socialism, uh, the political scientists will tell us, uh, you know, it's because it kills incentive, and it certainly does. But I think it's deeper than that. Because countries that have been socialistic and then they begin to work themselves out of it, it takes decades. It takes whole, almost a whole new generation to pull themselves out of the victim mentality that they've fallen into. It's very dangerous, very, very dangerous. And um, it, 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 it destroys human beings. Mm-hmm. So, and there are, you know, there is, hey, does he identify things or an issue in the country today? I mean, has has tuition gotten completely crazy in colleges and universities, and has student debt um, become uh, almost intolerable? You, you bet. Are there things we could do about that? Yeah, there are things we can do, and there are things we should have done, and and things we still should should do. Uh, but 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 uh, uh, the approach that everything's going to be for free. Because you can't really handle that on your own, we have to help you with it. That's that's not a that's not a good that's not a, a good mental place mm-hmm. to put your move out of victimhood and move into empowerment, becoming empowered instead right. of staying a victim. So we just have a few more minutes here. What are what are some of the key points takeaways uh, for, from our interview today or from your book? We've been well, discussing I appreciate, it, but. <laughs> I appreciate uh, discussing all this stuff with you. Uh, it, um, I think, you know, I, it was very cathartic for me to, by, by the way, write the book uh, because it did cause me to go back and look at my own life and to try to figure out, uh, okay, why why do I have that low fear factor? Or why do I have this positive uh, thought process going on. Uh, you know, I mentioned in the book, you know, I just, I was so lucky to have a great part of the lucky stuff was I had a great mom, even though my mom didn't have uh, a lot of education mm-hmm. and she didn't have a lot of skills to go out and make a lot of money. Um, every night when I was a kid, before I go to sleep, she would read my palm. My mom had no ability to read palms. She never studied (laughs) anything else. But she would pretend to read my palm and tell me about how how my my success line, how long it was, and you know, it was my destiny to be successful, et cetera, et cetera. And uh, you know, what what a great thing for a mom to do to instill uh, a child. Yes, to to make you feel positive, no matter. How, how negative things were around us. We didn't have any money. We'd be kicked out of apartments because we couldn't pay the rent. You know, we had all this negativity around us, but mom somehow was able to create this very positive mood for both me and my sister. And, uh, you know, that's extraordinary. 
Mm-hmm. And but you know, it's also an example of no matter where we are, no matter how down you are, you know, you you can at any moment of now begin to change your life. Mm-hmm. And you know, you you mentioned this you, you mentioned it a few minutes ago. You know, nothing happens nothing happened in the past, nothing happens in your future. Everything happens in a moment of now. Mm-hmm. There's a moment of now when you actually pick up the pen and start writing your book. Or it's a moment of now when you decide, you know what? I'm going off a high dive on this business idea I have. I'm going to take a chance, see if there's water in the pool. It's, you know, it's it's saying now is the time and actually getting up and doing it. Maybe when this uh, show ends, somebody will decide to make that change after listening to this and listening to you. And where can people get your book? I'm sure, I know it's not released oh. yet, but this book will help assist a person do that. It gets uh, released on uh, Tuesday next week, March 10th, and uh, you could order it through Amazon, Barnes & Noble, all your usual places. I know a couple of companies that own bookstores and airports are going to be, uh, they bought a bunch of books, so I think it'll be pretty visible. Mm-hmm. Wow, that's inspiring. It's absolutely inspiring. Your your accomplishments in life and uh, being an entrepreneur and writing this book, that's been quite a quite a noble life. Well, thank you. I've been very, very fortunate. Okay. And again, thank you everybody for coming to the call. And we'll see you next week at the same time, same place. And thank you, Terry, again. And we'll see you guys. Bye now.